Spinner 30, that should be the name of the uh, 30, which relates to chapter 9. And this is going to be an introduction. For, I just realized something. You know, we should be, I should write down the name, like, like the name. I should write down at the beginning of every tape what, it, what, it, what, the, what, it, what this is, so we should see it. Introduction to hypothesis testing, which sounds complicated, but it's not after you get into the details. Hypothesis testing, which is chapter 9. It's also chapter 10. It's also your entire final. The entire final will boil down to one topic called hypothesis testing, with basically one formula with a couple of small variations. OK. Um, here's the problem that we have. We have in the back of the book, and hopefully by now a lot of you have seen it, it's part of whatever the steps we've went through, we have a random number table. As you've done, and again, I apologize for not returning the spinner assignments that I should have returned already, but what you did as part of the early parts of the spinner assignment, you actually picked, I don't know, 100 numbers or 1,000 numbers, or you looked at all the numbers and worked out the x's and the p of x's. And we know all kinds of things about that table, but the bottom line is the average of those numbers, which run between 0 and 9, the average is right in the middle, and it comes out to 4.5. So if it's a good random number table, among all the other characteristics that we know about it, it should have an average of 4.5. We happen to also know from even a little more advanced calculations that the sigma which quantifies that range of 0 to 9 is 2.87. If that number is not familiar to you, ask me after class to, to, to explain it again, but, but not now. Now the, the, We know that from a fact. We've established that. You've handed it in already, and you're supposed to know that. It also happens to have you know, an equal number of zeros and ones and twos and threes and fours and fives. That's a separate issue. But the bottom line is a table should have an average of 4.5. So if somebody's perusing a brand new random number table, not ours necessarily, but something, you know, in, every, in every stat book there's a different random number table. And somebody, say the chairman of the, of the stat department, gets in the book in the mail from a publisher a brand new book. And that book has an average, has a, uh, a random number table. And the, and the chairman, reading an article in the New York Times, which is actually true, that some of these tables are really messed up. You would think they make them correctly. But they, there is a way of messing them up. And they, there are a number of books with messed up tables. The chairman says, I'm going to check to see if this tab table is good. And if it's good, I'm going to buy this book for the whole department, which, of course, is a, a many thousand of dollars of decision and affects the publisher. If, you, if, if, if your book is adopted by St. John's University, you're going to make a lot of money. So the best way to decide if the table has an average of 4.5, of course, is to take every single number. In our, in our place, there are two pages with consisting of 4,000 numbers. And you sit there for a couple of hours, or you tell a secretary or you tell a graduate assistant to do, add up 3 plus 7 plus 2 plus 9 plus 4. Just add them all up, divide by 4,000. If it comes out to 4.5, you know your, your answer is correct. If it comes out to 4.7, it means there's a mistake in the table. And it's supposed to come out to 4.5. OK, so, but the chairman is somewhat lazy and says, I can't have the time to take all 4,000 numbers. In fact, some books give you 20 pages of random numbers, and nobody can add up 20 pages, unless you scan it in or something like that. You can't add up 20 pages of random numbers. So the, the, the next best thing, anybody want to take a suggestion? What's the next best thing in having every single member of the whole population? What's the next best thing? Take you a sample. So you take a sample. The only question is, what size sample? And if you were probably going to do this, you say, I'll take a sample of 100. 200 because, you know, it doesn't take that much time to add up 200 numbers. But let's say the, cha the chairman is really lazy and takes only five numbers. Now, can you make a decision based on five numbers? You can. It won't be a, won't be a great decision. You might be off, make, may, might make a mistake, but you can make a decision on, based on five numbers. And let's say, for example, you're investigating a brand new dangerous drug. You can't get more than five volunteers to take the drug, so you've got to make your decision. Should I continue developing this drug based on a small sample? So sometimes a small sample is the best you can do. So you take the five numbers, you know, basically you want it to be a random, so you pick a number here, a number here, a number here. You want it to be random so that it's representative. You don't want to just pick all the zeros or something like that. And how do you think you're going to process those five numbers? What's the most logical thing to do with the five numbers? You want to calculate? Yeah, you want to get the average. The average is the key number here. So let's say the average came out to 4.5. Well, obviously that proves that, the, that, that's, you know, that means your table is OK. No one's going to say, well, that proves the table's bad. But what if it came out to 4.6? What if the sample of five numbers came out to 4.6? Do we have, uh, Brian, another couple of minutes with you? OK. Let's say it came out to 4.6. What would you do then? Is 4.6 the same as 4.5? Well, from a mathematical point of view, the answer is no. But what about from a practical point of view? Now, here, but here, before you answer the question, I want you, here's where, again, early parts of the spinner assignment were so critical to 
understanding this material. Back on spinner assignment number 18, I asked you to pick samples of five numbers from the back of the book or from the Excel, which is equivalent. And the guys who did it should be recognizing the following list of possible numbers, 4.8, 4.2, 3.6, 6.4, 3.0, 2 .6. These are the kind of numbers that everybody's pretty much should have gotten. And if it's not familiar and you think you did all your work, please ask me after class to explain. But I think anyone who did their work recognizes this is the kind of numbers you're going to get. Now, these numbers came from a good random number table or a bad random number table. Well, you don't know for sure. Did, did, did Bill Gates do his job? correctly when he created the Excel to generate the random numbers, which is how we got these numbers. Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. He's the richest man in the world. Let's assume he knows what he's doing. So these numbers are coming from a table which are perfectly good. This is a good table. Do you get 4.5, 4.5, 4.5, 4.5, 4.5? No, you don't get that because that's just you know, common sense. We predict it's something called sampling variability. Each sample is different. Each average is going to be a little bit different. While most of them should be close to 4.5, you're going to get some variability. So the question, the more intelligent way of answering the question, this 4.6 back up, and there are two possibilities. We're going to call those, again, I didn't really mean to introduce this right now, but but let's do that. H sub 0 is called a null hypothesis, meaning it's a status quo that no problems going on. The H sub 1 is called the alternative hypothesis. And this is claiming the average truly is 4.5. Namely, it's a good table. Let's put it down in a good, a good random number table, which has an average of 4.5. And the opposite, the H1, is claiming there's something messed up here that it's not 4.5. I don't care how much it's messed up, it's just messed up. It's a bad table. So how would you interpret, this is your data, this is your evidence. How would you interpret the 4.6 as backing up the A0 or backing up the H1? That's the question I posed a minute ago. Now we can phrase it a little more precisely. Does the A0 back up the A0 or back up the H1? And that's what I want somebody to answer. Hopefully quickly. And by the way, I owe, you, I owe you a couple of those papers for your answers previously. Does 4.6 back up the A0? In other words, would you say after seeing this data, you know, this table's messed up? Or would you say, no, the table's a pretty good table. This is about as close as you're going to get. How would you interpret the 4.6? Yes? Yeah, well, uh, the fact is, when you took five numbers previously, you didn't get 4.6. You get 4.6 is, is, is one of the closer ones. Most of the time, you get further away from 4.5. So an educated interpretation of what's happening, based on your experience with spinner assignment uh, 18, this is spinner assignment 18, is that 4.6 is about as close as you're going to get, and therefore I would say the table's a pretty good table. Certainly, when, especially if you give the, this is an important point. We give the benefit of the doubt to the status quo. We don't know, you don't go around accusing a publisher of, of publishing a bad table unless you have evidence for that. The guy's innocent and still proven guilty. So we give the benefit of the doubt to zero, and 4.6 is not evidence to prove the guy is giving us a bad table, because our experience with other tables, or a good table, is getting very similar, even worse results. Okay, what about if this number here was a 4.4? Would you say it belongs to the A0 or belongs to the H, proves the A0 or proves the H1? Because there's a tenth of a point below or a tenth of a point, who cares if above or below? Well, later on we will care, but right now we don't care. So again, this proves the A0. It proves the A0. What about if it was a 4.8? Does it prove the A0 or prove the H1? 48 is relatively close, not perfectly the same as 4.5. It's a little further away than 4.6, but it's still within the ballpark of a typical number that would come out of a perfectly good table. So, so, so it's important that I, I convince you of that, that, that 4.8 should be interpreted as, again, evidence that the table is, is good. Because it's not that far away from 4.5. And in fact, your experience with taking numbers out of a perfectly good table very often you got numbers even more extreme than 4.8, like 5.0, 5.2, 5.4, or 4.2, or 4.0, or 4.3.8. That's very common. So getting a number like 4.8 should not be interpreted as rejecting the A0, claiming or relieving the H1. I'm claiming, and it's important, again, that, that everybody agrees, and I hope especially you, because you, you mentioned it, that 4.8, unless you're interpreting it a different way. I'm not sure how you're interpreting it. Well, we have one mean. The average, of, we took a sample of five numbers. 
Four, we've got 4.8. Now we've got to make a decision. Is that, is that evidence that the table is a good table? We would expect ideally a number of about 4.5, but you don't really expect 4.5, you expect 4.5 plus or minus a little bit of you know, error. 